Hello friends, welcome to the broadcast. I am Larry Hutton and this is Limitless Life where we let Jesus take all the limits of our life. I am so thrilled that that following after the real living Jesus, not some religious figure, not some religion where people have a bunch of do's and don'ts and all that, but, but the real Jesus, he gives life and he gives it more abundantly. He wants you free in your mind and your emotions where you have peace and joy all the time. He wants you free from sickness and disease and physical pain. He wants you out of debt and having plenty of money left over so you can be a blessing to others. Everything about Jesus is, is, is back to the Garden of Eden, really, is what it's all about. Back to the Garden of Eden before sin. I mean, and Adam and Eve had it, as the old saying goes, made in the shade. <laughs> they even walked with God in the shade of the day. <laughs> they had it made. Why? There was no sin. With no sin, everything about their life was top-notch, blessed, fun, happy, joyous, peaceful, prosperous, everything about their life. And Jesus is called the last Adam. Why? He restored us back into the position uh, of the first Adam before sin. So we don't need a second or third Adam. Jesus was not the second. He was the last, is what the scripture says. The Bible doesn't call him second Adam. He was the last Adam, meaning we don't need another. And he has restored us to abundant life. So we don't have to wait till we get to heaven. That's why Jesus prayed, thy will be done on where? Earth as it is where? In heaven. So you and I can live a heavenly life while we're on planet earth. I remember growing up in church and all I ever heard was all about the sweet by and by. Well, it is going to be sweet and it's going to be wonderful and there's not going to be any more death, sorrow, crying, pain. There's no more sickness, disease, no more poverty, no more lack, no more depression, no more, no more any curse. It's going to be wonderful. But Jesus said we can live with the same will of God that's going to be for heaven down here on the earth, we can have that will of God operating in our lives. People don't think that's even possible, but if you look at the words out of the mouth of Jesus, you see it's possible. We can live the abundant life. I'm a living example. I mean, I by no means arrived and I, you know, I'm, I'm not the sharpest uh, knife in the drawer, that's for sure, but, but I just look at... Uh, at what God's done in my life and how he healed me of an incurable disease many years ago and then how he taught me to live in peace and joy where I don't ever have down days or discouraged days or stress-filled days or strife-filled days or anger-filled days. I just don't have those anymore since he taught me what the Word said. And, and uh, my wife and I paid off our home, paid off every debt, uh, paid off our ministry, uh, property, everything. We're debt-free and and so it's all about Jesus. I give him the glory. Praise God. So, you know, I'm not bragging on me. I'm bragging on Jesus because I haven't arrived, but at least I left. <laughs> you know what I mean, right? I may not have arrived. I keep pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. But, but I'm not sitting back waiting for something to happen. I keep pressing. I keep moving to Jesus. I keep renewing my mind. I keep learning. And uh, if you do that, uh, you're going to have a life that's worth living. Let me tell you, it's, it's a wonderful life. So we've been doing a series that we started. Uh, this is actually the 36th program. So we have actually done 35 programs before this. So we're in our eighth week. We're, we'll be completing eight weeks this week, uh, which means two months, uh, two months on this subject. Doctor, this is the name of our series we're doing. Dr. Jesus is in the house. I love the title, Dr. Jesus. Uh, because Christ lives in me, my hope of glory, he lives in me. So Jesus, the doctor that doesn't practice medicine, that has never misdiagnosed and never um, misappropriated uh, any medicine. I mean, every, every medicine that he has ever uh, assigned to a sickness or disease has always worked 100% of the time and worked perfectly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I just love Dr. Jesus. And so he lives in this house. This body of ours is called our earthly house. And so Christ liveth in me is what the Apostle Paul said. So we've been studying this because if you understand Jesus lives in you, then you don't have to try and pray and hopefully get your prayers up above the ceiling and hopefully someday maybe he'll hear and answer your prayers. No, Dr. Jesus is in the house. 
He's, he's your roommate. He's already living with you. You're living in him and he's living in you. And so, boy, that just makes it all so simple when you get started getting a hold of this revelation. So we've been studying a, a story in Luke. We've been looking at a lot of different uh, stories, a lot of different uh, scriptures to help us establish how to be healed in our bodies. And we're going to keep doing that more and more as we go on. Uh, so let's go, go back to the story in Luke 5 that we've been reading and let's pick it up again in verse 17. Uh, it happened that on a certain day that Jesus was teaching. It says there were Pharisees and teachers of the law that were sitting by. They weren't, they weren't expecting, they weren't believing Jesus, they weren't drawing upon His, they weren't teachable, but they were sitting by. They had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. Um, and it says the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Well, if the power was present to heal them, then God wanted them healed, right? God didn't make a mistake. So God's power was present, but we're going to go on reading and found out even though the power was present, nothing was happening. Really very interesting. We, and we talked about that in more detail in a few, pro, a few programs ago. Uh, so verse 18 says, Then, after the power was already present to heal them, those that were already there, the doctors, law, and Pharisees obviously were sick because God sent His power to heal them. But nobody was taking hold of the power, even though it was there. And it's interesting, the power was there. No building was shaking. No people were falling. You would think if God's power was present, something would be happening. But see, you have to understand it's God's power can flow from this spirit realm. God is a spirit. Those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. So it can flow out of that supernatural, eternal. That's even a better term than spirit realm if you really want to get people to understand it. The eternal realm that's going to last forever. Um, in fact, that eternal realm is what made everything in this natural realm is what Hebrews said. So anyway... Um, you can get that power out of the supernatural realm, out of the spirit realm, out of the uh, unseen realm, out of the eternal realm, and you can get it to flow into this natural realm. But that wasn't happening here. It says in verse 17, God's power was present to heal them, but none of them got healed. So now we're studying him, why him did and them didn't, <laughs> if you pardon the English. So verse 18 uh, we talked about the men that, the four men that brought a man. It doesn't say it here in Luke, but if you read the other Gospels, we find out he was born of four or carried by four people. Uh, verse 18 says, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed. So we don't know the extent of the paralysis, but obviously he couldn't walk because he's on a bed. It said they sought a way to get him in, verse 19, but they couldn't find a way. That means they did seek, seek and ye shall find. So they sought and couldn't find a way. I, I'm thinking it's the guy in the bed that as they're carrying him around the building trying to find a way to get in, he's the one with the best view of the roof and <laughs> probably was his idea. Hey guys, okay, so all the entrances are packed like sardines, can't get in, but look, the roof's not that steep. Get me up there. Come on, two of you climb up, two of you lift me up. I'm not going home without my healing. I'm not going home without my miracle. Jesus is my answer. And so... Uh, they, they couldn't find a way, verse 19, to bring him in because of the crowd. They went on the housetop, let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. So they went to extreme measures, obviously. Verse 20, Jesus saw their faith. And we talked about you can't see faith. You have to see the actions of faith. So Jesus saw their faith. He saw them taking the roof apart and letting them down. And he going to great extent. And okay, these guys are believing something here. I can, faith pleases God. Without faith, it's impossible, Hebrews eleven six. 6. That means with faith, it's possible to please God. And so... He saw their faith and he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. The scribes and Pharisees began to reason saying, you, you are a blasphemer. Only God can forgive sins. But Jesus perceived their thoughts and said, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Actually, the word hearts is referring to what he just said in the, or what it just said in the previous statement. Jesus perceived their thoughts. So if you look up the word hearts, it can be translated as the heart or spirit of man, but it also can be translated as the thoughts or emotions, feelings. So Jesus perceived their thinking, what they were thinking, and said, why are you trying to figure this out? Why are you going in a tizzy in your minds? Uh, in verse 23, he said, I could have just, just as easily said, be healed as I said, be forgiven. King James, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you or rise up and walk? In other words, I could have just as easily said, be healed. But I said, be forgiven. 
and you guys got all messed up about it, and you're thinking. But, verse 24, that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, be healed. Arise, take up your bed and walk. In other words, be healed. Go to your house. Verse 25, immediately rose up before them, took up that where he lay and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And so we were looking, we left off in verse 20, uh, this past program, in verse 20, uh, where Jesus says, uh, man, your sins are forgiven you. So very interesting. They got uh, all in a tizzy and messed up because I can't believe he said your sins are forgiven. But they didn't know Jesus. Uh, he and the Father are one. And so uh, God can forgive sin. Jesus can forgive sin, right? He is the Redeemer. They didn't know him as the Redeemer. And so uh, they got all mad. But verse 20 said, He saw their faith and said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. Actually, the Greek word sin here, when he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you, the Greek word is harmatia. Uh, harmatia. Uh, it's a noun. Uh, it's really singular. It's a noun that's singular. It means to sin or to miss the mark. I'll show you that it can be used in the plural, but I'm going to first of all stay with the noun, the Greek word, the singular word, uh, where it says your sin. So really when Jesus said, man, your sins are forgiven, he was really saying your sin. And then that, the one sin, which we'll talk about here in a second, uh, will take care of all the rest of your sins. But the word harmatia uh, is the same word actually used in John. In fact, I'm going to take you over to John 16, chapter 9, because you need to see this. I want you to see this noun used again, this word sin in the singular. Here it looks like it's used in the plural, at least King James, some of those translations. Man, your sins are forgiven you. Let's look at this same word in John 16, 9. Uh, for, let's start reading in verse 7, uh, John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. He's talking to his disciples, you know, he's getting ready for the crucifixion and go on and going to heaven and all. So he's telling them, uh, okay, guys, it's going to actually bless you. It's going to be, a, King James says, expedient. Uh, New King James says, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come, talking about the Holy Spirit. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin. Here's the word harmatia that we looked at. Uh, uh, man, your sins are forgiven you. Uh, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin. Here it is again, the same Greek word. Of sin. Notice it's in the singular in both of these verses. Verse 9. Of sin, because they believe, uh, do not believe in me. Uh, of righteousness, verse 10, of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. And verse 11, of judgment, because the ruler of the world is judged. And we know that's talking about Satan. All right, so look at verses 8 and 9. Verse 8, when he is come, talking about the Holy Spirit, when he is come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. So when the Holy Spirit was sent to take the place of Jesus on the earth, Jesus says he would convict, right? Convict the world. Three things, sin, righteousness, and judgment. So Jesus said he's, he's sent, he's going to take the place of, of me, and he's going to convict. This word uh, convict, it means to convince. Uh, it means to convict. It means to uh, tell a fault. And according to what Jesus said, he's going to convince, the Holy Ghost is going to convince men and women in three areas, sin, righteousness, and judgment. So what's the first thing that the Holy Spirit is going to convict or convince people of? It says their sin. Remember, harmatia, miss the mark. Hmm. Of their sin. But if you try and interpret that without the context, you'll, miss, you'll misinterpret it. You won't rightly divide the word of truth. So notice the first thing the Holy Spirit's going to convict is people of their sin, singular. They miss the mark, not of their sins. But he goes on in the next verse and tells them the only sin that will cause them to miss the mark. Watch this. Verse 9. 
of sin because they believe not on me. Whoa. So not believing in Jesus, according to Jesus' own mouth, is the only sin that will send someone to hell. This is, this is the sin Jesus said the Holy Spirit will convict every human being of. You've got to receive Jesus. You've got to receive Jesus. You've got to receive Jesus. Remember, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So the Holy Spirit is going to say, same thing as Jesus, same thing as the Father. He's going to say, <clears throat> uh, you need Jesus. You reject Jesus, that's the only sin that will send you to hell. So it's not uh, cussing, smoking, drinking, running around with people that do. No, that's not what's going to send you to hell. I think there's going to be a lot of shocked Christians when they get to heaven and they see people that they think, well, you're not going to go to heaven because you drink or because you smoke or you do this or you do that. Listen, some of their sins probably aren't as bad as the sins other people are of, of judging and uh, uh, of uh, uh, treating people terrible or unforgiveness or, you know, there's a lot of them mentioned in the scripture. Uh, so... Uh, I think a lot of people are going to be shocked they're going to get to heaven and say, whoa, you made it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they made it because they accepted Jesus. Now, that's not giving us a license to sin. I'm just showing you the only sin that can keep somebody out of heaven. Only sin that can keep somebody out of heaven. God has never sent one human being to hell, not one. That should answer your question because a lot of people will say, well, I just can't believe a loving God would send somebody to hell. He never has. He never will. A loving God won't do that. In fact, a loving God so loved you and every human being that He sent Jesus, all they have to do is receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and pfft, they don't go to hell. Hell was never created them for them in the first place. Hell, according to the Scriptures, was created for the devil and his followers, his angels. So God wants every human being saved. It got, the Scripture says God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So... Not believing in Jesus is the only sin that will send somebody to hell. Let's look at 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2 where it says Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. That's a term we don't really use in our language today. Uh, and not for, look at the verse, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. See, so every single individual the sin, singular, of rejecting Jesus and all that, every single person. So the sins of everybody. Jesus bore the sins of every single person. Uh, and so it says um, Jesus is the propitiation. Simply put, pr propitiation mead means uh, he made the payment. That's the easiest way to understand propitiation. It means he made the payment. Well, what does Romans 6, 23 say? The wages of sin. Sounds like a payment does, needs to be made, doesn't it? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So how do we receive the gift? Well, the wages have to be paid. Oh, Jesus made the payment. He was the propitiation. He was the pay, pay payment for our sins. God so loved the... This tells you then how you receive the gift or how you receive the eternal life. God so loved the world. John 3.16, everybody knows, or most people know it. John 3.16, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. Whoever does what? Whoever believes. What does that mean? Put their faith in. See, faith connects us to forgiveness. Why? Because faith in Jesus makes Him Lord and Savior and His blood washes you clean. Look at 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13. These things have I written to you that believe, or in other words, to you that have faith in Jesus. Uh, you believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So see, that's how I know. I'm not wondering if I'm going to make it to heaven. I, I know that I have eternal life because God doesn't lie. He's not a man that He can lie. So that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe, that means have faith, on the name of the Son of God or on the name of Jesus. Let's skip uh, to John. Well, let's go over to John chapter 3 and verse number 36. 
John 3, 36, he that believes, what does that mean? Has faith in Jesus. He that believes on the Son or on Jesus has everlasting life. I love it. And he that believes not does not put their faith in. In other words, what it says, he that believes not does not put their faith in. The Son shall not see or have or experience life but the wrath of God abides on him. Let's jump over to Galatians chapter 3. I just want to see, see some of these scriptures so we're understanding what's happening when Jesus speaks to this guy. Your sins are forgiven you. Notice in verse 26 of Galatians 3, For you are all children of God by faith in who? Christ Jesus. By faith in the anointed. The word Christ is the anointed. Savior Jesus. Hmm, Messiah Jesus. So you put your faith in Jesus. What does this verse say in Galatians 3, 26? You become a child of God. So then faith in Jesus releases God's forgiveness. Uh, in fact, Ephesians 2, 5, this is 1, 2, 5, and 6. Even when we were dead in sins, God has made us alive. You, uh, King James says, has quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved, and then has raised us up together, Ephesians 2, 6, raised us up together, and we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. So that lets us know that we were dead, but when we put our faith in Jesus, then the, we're not dead in sins anymore. The sins are washed away. We are made whiter than the snow, the, the scripture says. And so now we're sitting uh, in a position of heaven with Jesus, uh, sitting together with Christ Jesus. So let's go back to Luke 5, 20, where we were now. When he saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. Hmm. Man, your sins are forgiven you. And when he said that, guess what happened? His sins were forgiven. <laughs> Boy, that was deep, wasn't it? <laughs> man, man, your sins are forgiven forgiven you. That means his sins were forgiven. Jesus wasn't blowing smoke. That means his faith, which he just said in the word, Jesus saw their faith, then that means their faith connected them to forgiveness of sin. So that means if you need healing in your body and there's sin in your life, then accepting Jesus as your healer, which is what the man was doing. He came, tore off the roof. The Bible already said in verse 17, power of the Lord was present to heal, not forgive. But now we're seeing the power that was present to heal would also forgive. Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. And so the man comes in and when Jesus says that, we know he was forgiven because of what Jesus goes on to say, which we'll get into detail next program. But it's so cool because it applies to you and me. Your sins are forgiven, which really tells me right then the man could have risen up from the bed, but he needed more understanding. And of course, the teaching Jesus goes on to teach is pretty powerful and, and applies to you and me so we can apply it and be healed. If you need healing in your body, you don't want to miss this next program. In fact, you don't want to miss this that we're tying into the next program, putting them together. Your sins are forgiven. If you believe in Jesus, then your sins are forgiven, which means now you're connected to Jesus, right? We just found out as many as uh, put their faith in Jesus are the children of God. So now you're children of God. Jesus now lives in you. Dr. Jesus is in the house. And now you're connected to the very one that has the power, which means the power's in you if Jesus is in you. The Holy Spirit's in you. That's the glory of God in you. That's the power of God in you. Man, you have everything you need to be healed right now of anything. No matter where you're at, no matter what it is, I don't care if they say it's incurable, it's not incurable at all. There's nothing hard too hard for God. All things are possible to him that believeth. With God, all things are possible. Really? Yeah, that, that's the truth. And so he saw their faith and he said, man... Your sins are forgiven. Well, the scribes and Pharisees began to reason, oh, this man's blaspheming, only God can forgive sins. But again, they didn't know that this was Jesus. Uh, God made manifest in the flesh, you know, their Redeemer. It was, he was their healer. I mean, God wanted them healed. Verse 17, remember? 
God's power was present to heal them. And so now them are getting all mad at him for saying what he said, be forgiven. I wonder if they would have gotten mad if he'd have said, be healed. Well, we'll go on and see that. We already read the rest of the story, but he did say, be healed, and the guy gets healed. And then because it was the Sabbath, they get mad. Well, you can't do that. God can do anything because every when Jesus came, every day is the day of the Sabbath. You don't have to wait till a certain day of the week to receive anything from God or to rest in God or to be free from sin or to be free from any curse because Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. He's Lord of every day. This is a day the Lord hath made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. All right. Well, we're out of time. We're going to have to pick up here next program. So, uh, but, I, but I just wanted you to see in case the devil's been lying to you. Well, you know what? You just don't know. Maybe there's sins that's stopping you from being healed. No, no, no. Flat N-O exclamation point. No, that's not stopping you. What's stopping you may be from a lack of knowledge. The Bible said we're destroyed for a lack of knowledge in Hosea 4, 6, or Isaiah 5, 13, my people go into captivity because they have no knowledge. So we'll get more knowledge this next program and we're gonna help you understand that it's easy to be healed just like it's easy to be forgiven. In fact, both are easy. We'll see that next program. We love you, we call you blessed, thank you for your partnership. And until next time, I love you, have a Jesus-filled day. Life and death are in the power of your tongue. With your own words, you can release the power of life that will bring health to your body. God's healing grace is released through faith, and faith is released through what you say. Your healing is in your mouth. God wants you to be whole, well, and healthy. But if you have not heard his word on it, how can you have faith to call on him as your healer? These 52 Declare It cards have a healing scripture from God's word on one side and a corresponding declaration of faith, which you can speak about yourself on the other. Hearing God's word concerning your healing will build your faith to walk through life in complete confidence that every sickness or disease that ever attacks you must depart. To order your prescription for health declare it cards, go to larryhutton.org or call us at 888-887-WORD. Join us again for Limitless Life with Dr. Larry Hutton where you'll get practical teaching from God's Word that you can apply to your everyday life. Go to LarryHutton.org to watch this program and many others. You'll find special offers and resources to help you thrive in life. You can check on Larry and Liz's schedule and join them at a meeting near you. That's LarryHutton.org or you can call 888-887-WORD.